Fantastic. I'm not sure if you can hear me. Can you? Yes, I can hear yes? you. Yeah. Ah, fantastic. And we can hear you. It's wonderful. Thank ah. you very much for joining us. It's um, a pleasure. Yes. Yeah. And we're going to turn the computer around so you can see all these wonderful people here in Dublin. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Sorry, I, I couldn't be there with you. <laughs> And again, yeah, yeah. welcome, and after your brief presentation, we'll have time for a few questions. So please, welcome. Thanks, yeah, it's a pleasure. You can go ahead. <laughs> Do I go ahead? Yes, yes. Oh, okay, splendid. I'm sorry I couldn't make it to the conference. Uh, I had prepared a paper titled uh, Africa at the Village Bell from Crisis to Opportunity. I would like to start by thanking Pascal Preston and his colleagues for the invitation to speak at a plenary session of what I consider a very important conference. As a 50-year-old African, I'm used to life as a continuous crisis and to reading and writing books that perhaps portray Africa as a continent of crisis and unfulfilled expectations of renaissance and modernity. I grew up knowing Africa as a continent where exogenously generated ideas of social change dominated the attention of the often reluctant, fumbling, self-absorbed, and self-contradictory power elite. It was a time when the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, in conjunction with European and North American leaders, prescribed structural adjustment programs and tough austerity measures that today received the wrath of citizens across Europe from Greece to Spain and beyond. Until the 1990s, for the few who could afford to make a telephone call, it was still the order of the day to have to deal, to die through London, Paris, Brussels, Lisbon, or Madrid to reach a neighboring African country and to fly through Europe to cross the continent. Today, with the proliferation of cell phones and related new technologies, this particular crisis is not as acute as it used to be. Africans traveling by air were notoriously overburdened by excess luggage as they contended with moving between disparate realms of accumulation and sought to redistribute consumer items between countries, north and south, east and west. Today, with South African shopping malls sprouting up throughout the continent, and with more and more shops in Europe and North America selling foodstuffs and other non-Western goods which mobile Africans desire, there is less need to travel with bulky suitcases and Ghana must go bags. You can imagine how ironic I find it that Europeans and North Americans are coming home to the reality of life as a continuous crisis when Africans of my generation have lived continuous crises as a normal condition of being. National Geographic, which used to feature us as the primitive lords of the forest, now produces in particular for its European readers as a special survival manual safest moves in any emergency from tornado to flood. The adaptability and resilience we learned and practiced 
on a day-to-day -day basis, growing up at the frontier of nature and culture, now have to be documented and taught to those whose environments are increasingly vulnerable to the whims and caprices of humans and nature. Curiously, a term such as the informal economy, initially used by Keith Hart to describe aspects of the Ghanaian economy that defy the logic of rational choice, is increasingly relevant to European economies. To get in touch with the green poles of opportunity on the continent, I decided to turn to my 60-year-old daughter, Sue. How would, she, how would she describe the world to, through her eyes and experience? She is currently in high school in Mankon, in Bamenda, in northwestern Cameroon. She is preparing for the general certificate of education, advanced level in literature, French, history, religion. Our Lady of Lourdes College, the all-girl college, Catholic boarding school she attends, is run by reverend sisters of the Irish Holy Rosary Sisters Order from the Igbo region of neighboring Nigeria. Sue lived and schooled in Botswana for four years and in Senegal for three years when I was working in those countries. Since we moved to the University of Cape Town in 2009, she spends her June, August holidays with the rest of the family in Cape Town. For Christmas and Easter holidays, she's with her maternal and paternal grandparents, Mankan, to whom we regularly send remittances for, for their well-being as well as for Sue's upkeep. In maintaining contact and relating with our parents and Sue, the cell phone, internet, and institutions such as Western Union, Express Union, and MoneyGram are vital and have replaced the occasional traveler friend on whom we depended to send and receive news and funds in my school days and youth. In 2009, one of Sue's grandparents, Fonangwafo III, celebrated his jubilee as king of Mankan with an autobiography titled Royalty and Politics the story of my life. I helped write this through a series of lengthy interviews which Sue transcribed. She also assisted with the typeset of the book and the scanning of photos for inclusion. The book was published by Langer Research and Published Common Initiative Group, with which I am associated. Created in 2004 to promote research and publish material relevant to the cultural development and renaissance of Africa, Langa operates principally through volunteers and has been able to publish over 250 titles, mainly on Cameroon, but also on other African countries. Thanks for our collaboration with the African Books Collective in Oxford, Langa publishes mainly by print on demand and makes snippets of its book available through the Google Preview system. Credit card holders around the world purchase hard copy or electronic versions of the book via Amazon and other distributors. The collaboration with African Books Collective also allows Langa to pay modest royalty to its authors, something admittedly these days would publish. It is a feat, however, facilitated the distribution of these books on Africa, and in most cases by Africans in African bookshops, schools, and libraries. Back to Sue. Her life involves more than assisting transcription typesetting and scan. She is accumulating social and 
a cultural capture, myriads of other ways. She is an avid user and consumer of Facebook, where she has cultivated a network of hundreds of friends and developed a fascinating capacity and agility to multitask. On Facebook, she is as busy as a thousand soldiers, all working in different directions. In many regards, she has been at the forefront of the adoption and adaptation of information and communication technologies in the family. As a child in Haberbrunny, she loved playing games with our very first cell phone, a Motorola. It was like a pig with a long antenna. We enjoyed hand, enjoy handing cell phones down our children and others. But Sue is good at misplacing them. And neither her mom nor I can always discern whether this is deliberate or accident. She exudes a fatal inclination to embrace the latest and cheapest in this technology. Even without owning one herself, she shares with us the virtues of smartphones and tablets and explains why iPhone 4S is better than the iPhone 5, and neither is as smart as the Samsung Galaxy, which is seen as being more accommodating and inclusive of African consumers who do not necessarily shop credit. I can relate to this after a recent experience in Palo Alto, where, inspired by the modest house of Steve Jobs, founding CEO of Apple, I bought an iPhone 4S only to realize I had bought myself into a gated community where the only currency that matters is the credit card. Yet my daughter seems to master these gadgets better than those of us who own them. News to Sue is news of the world of celebrities and stars, as well as news she and her Facebook friends share amongst themselves. It is thanks to Sue and her sister that my otherwise boring lectures at the university are sometimes exciting. They regularly feed me with profiles and updates of developments in the lives of Hollywood and other celebrities, such as Kim Kardashian and Kanye West, Beyonce, Lady Gaga, Rihanna, and Justin Bieber. As I stepped down from the plane June 17th, back from the University of Mauritius, which I visited as an ex external examiner for communication studies, Sue informs me a version of breaking news that Kim Kardashian, who is married to Kanye West, has just given birth five weeks earlier than expected, a baby girl who looks exactly like she does. But Sue showed little interest the next day when I saw breaking news of my own of issues such as the hospitalization of Nelson Mandela, the G8 summit in Ireland, President Obama's decision to start negotiations with the Taliban in Afghanistan, and the election of Hassan Rouhani as the president of, Sudan, of, of Iran. I suppose I should have mentioned how Senator Ali's hip hop party dropped news to see her reaction to that. Lest we rush to conclude that Sue and young African girls and boys like her, a victim of Western imperialism and consumerism, and that they are guilty of mimicry and of modeling themselves after Western stars and desire. Let me announce that there is much more to sue than meets the eye. She is just as avid a consumer of Nollywood films and Nigerian music and just as knowledgeable about Nigerian stars, such as Jim Ike, uh, NFF 90, OK OK, and others, all of whom she considers I 
Christian station amongst most Cameroonian youth. She is a, fa a fan of Kem Awards and adores his music, such as his movies, such as Sophia in London and The Master, which features the song At the Top Your Dollar. She loves the videos of East West and particularly adores their song, My Movie, which has caught summer by storm. I can go on and on. Just as Hollywood producers and actors are sometimes inspired by themes, events, and developments in Africa, Nollywood actors and producers sometimes model themselves to varying degrees Western celebrity events and development. In consuming film, music, and books from different parts of the world, those consumer practices are contesting stereotypical representation of Africa and what it means to be African. Obviously, not every African youth shares Sue's access to and experience with new information and communication technology. Many African youth still do not have as much access as to and may not have the mental or material capacity to gain access because of the circumstances around them. Indeed, Sue's experience might even be considered privileged and limited to the border cross free fire elite. Widely shared cultures of solidarity and conviviality, however, make possible creative sharing of technologies across Africa. Often, you do not have to own a cell phone personally to be able to use one. This is a single owner, multiple user approach. As I have attempted to demonstrate in previous work and in my current account of Sue, few Africans who embrace this technology use them exclusively to distance themselves from other Africans. If anything, more and more techno savvy youth harness technology to reconcile Africa's varied pains and assets and to create and maintain network and relations across social categories, spaces, and places. In many regards, Sue marries different world, which she negotiates and navigates with the effortlessness of Barack Obama, who is also known to reconcile many identity marks. Or should I compare her to Sandra and Mali, the Obama daughter. Sue reads J.K. Rowling's Harry Potter series alongside African novel Chino Achebe's Things for a Part and Arrow of God to Chimamande Adechi's Purple Hibiscus, Half uh, Yellow uh, Sun, an American. Just as she reads Stephanie Meyer's Twilight Saga and books by Nicholas Park, Judy Picard. She even dares to read a dad's boring novel sometimes. Youth like Sue are actually disgusted by repression and procrastination that we, their parents and grandparents, have borne in the face of domination. We have often failed to assert ourselves enough when our states and governments have catered more for foreign interests than for our own very well-being as citizens. Africa's foreign and multinational partners have often insisted on state support and favors, legislation and regulations as a guarantee against the full vicissitudes and turbulence of daring venture marginal and highly unpredictable zones of accumulation that Africa has traditionally represented. The weakness of African state in relation to rich nations international financial institutions and multinationals is well known. Equally well known has been Africa's peripheral position in the global economy 
politics. This has often left African governments and states in a position where the only real authority or semblance to power affordable to them is that which is aimed towards their own population, which are often too poor and too vulnerable to organize and mobilize effectively against exploitation and repression. It is hardly surprising that African states and governments yielded much more than their contested the dra draconian adjustment program imposed by the foreign partners and institutions of legitimation. This is the fate my generation has borne since its birth. It is the fate that soon our generation I challenge. If experiences like Sue's and those of the youth behind what has come to be known as Arab Spring are anything to go by, African youth have screamed loud and clear a farewell to the passive subservience and opportunism of their parents and grandparents in the face of crisis. They are appropriating information and communication technology to claim and voice and afford themselves social capital in space and places not accessible to them previously and on issues usually considered the preserved power elite. From Tunisia, where a young man set himself alive, make a point, waves of youth thirst for freedom of imagination. Freedom of action has reverberated across the continent, claiming dictators here and there, and gathering more and more money. From a continent used to being mislabeled and misrepresented, and being talked at or talked down upon, African youth are making it abundantly clear for those who care to read some that what they want is freedom they own This may include, but is by no means limited to the freedom of urban inner city youth where expensive clothes start removing the price tag and going out on thinking adventures. African youth want democracy not Western democracies, let alone Arab or African democracies. They want freedom of expression and presentation. They want the power to imagine and fulfill their imagination. They are determined not to repeat the mistakes of the parents and grandparents who tended to listen to the outside world much more than to voice it in if at all they bother to reckon with their own citizens. The outside world, the West in particular, was very good at outsourcing its dictatorship to make democracy possible within their own country. Dictators such as those in Tunisia, Egypt, and Libya were often in power, not so much because of them, but rather despite their they were propped up by allies beyond the frontiers of the countries they headed. During the bipolar world, such allies were either from the West or the East and increasingly became wholly West as bipolarity diminished and the Soviet Union sizzled out. What these youths want is democracy configured to satisfy their reality. Yes, it's a frontier world and a reality of comfort, not of binaries and cut. It is a world where enemies and friends are not defined a priori, as choice, as choice and contingency are in constant negotiation in the face of the ever-evolving sectors. Much more than in my beautiful day, there is a reality that calls calls upon them on a daily basis to navigate and negotiate various chasms and dichotomies in what it means to be, become and belong rooted in mobility. There is much more room for voice and potential, potentially active citizenship by today's youth. 
information and communication technologies, and the multiple types of corruption they enable provide space directly represent form and shape view, habitus and future in quite unprecedented way. Beyond my daughter, possibly her generation, what other indicators are there to be hopeful for a freer and more assertive Africa? As more and more communities around the world, including within former colonial power spaces, become more vulnerable, the playing field is gradually leveling as well. If Europe and North America are entering a crisis, Africans, Africa seems to be coming out of successive generations shaped by unequal encounters with Europe and its extension. Archaeologists remind us that Africa was the center of humanity, and some of them might even claim that Africa was the first colonizer when, as cradle of humankind, they exported humans to people the rest of the world. If this was colonialism, Africa's version of it rather behind. Africa was later tortured by the real thing, full-blown malignant colonialism steeped in capitalism issues, from which its elite have played that little doctrine beyond rhetoric, victimhood, and desperation. If today Africa is walking up to China, India, and Brazil, it is not because any South South initiative are necessarily going to solve Africa's problem. There is satisfaction simply in knowing that no single country or region has the monopoly of exploiting Africa. Now that China, India, and Brazil are actively competing for Africa's resources and attention, it is quite unlikely that Europe and North America will continue to approach Africa with a sense of entitlement and business as usual. As credible and light of humankind and human creativity and conviviality, Africa recognizes and celebrates its contribution to Barack Obama, a composite and individual, racially and socially speaking. As president of the most powerful country in the world, with a Kenyan father and American mother, and with ancestry and connections with almost every part of the world, including here in Ireland, Obama inhabits and straddles global identities in, in ways suggestive of Africa's capacity to accommodate despite not being accommodated in turn. In the field of communication technology, Africa is poised to be a nerve center in more than one regard. In September 2012, I attended a conference organized by the Human Sciences Research Council of South Africa on the re-emergence of astronomy in Africa, a transdisciplinary interface of knowledge systems. The conference, which held at Maropeng, popularly known as the Cradle of Humankind, was in anticipation of the thrills and challenges in knowledge production and communication that the hosting of the square kilometer array with its meerkat telescope by South Africa location. The meerkat is described as a world-class radio telescope designed to do groundbreaking science and promises to be the largest and most sensitive radio telescope in the Southern Hemisphere until the, the square kilometer array is completed around 2024. Fresh from staging one of the most successful FIFA uh, Soccer World Cup events in history, it is hardly surprising that uh, Naledi Pando, the South African Minister of Science and Tele uh, uh, 
tele, uh, and, and technology. From eight, we need the bid to host the telescope to winning the Science World Cup. Confident of the huge investment opportunity the project will bring South Africa and the eight other African countries that would host remote antenna stations. MTN, a South African cell phone company, is a world leader in telecommunications, spread across the African continent and also far into Middle Eastern countries such as Iran, Syria, Cyprus, Yemen, Afghanistan, and the Emperor. MTN is as its slogan uh, everywhere you go. It connects everyday lives within and across borders that are often difficult to penetrate otherwise. My own research on mobility, information and communication technologies on ICTs and connectivity indicate that South Africa, for example, migrants from West and Central Africa use MTN as a relatively inexpensive and reliable medium to perpetually communicate and connect with family and acquaintances back home. Cell phones are particularly useful in promoting cheaper banking options. M-Pesa, a cell phone bank initiative launched in Kenya in March 2007, has been adopted by many countries across Africa and beyond. For example, Afghanistan in 2008 and India in 2007. An initiative by MTN to facilitate mobile banking and mobile money by using cell phones far gaining in popularity across Africa. Similarly, the cell phone facilitates sending and receiving money through institutions such as Western Union. Kenya was the birthplace of Pesa and also of Ushaidi, a crowdsourcing platform used to track violence and promote social activism in the aftermath of Kenya's 2007 presidential election. Over the past decade, the initiative, innovative use of cell phones to monitor health at elections has placed Africa at the forefront of a revolution in the cell phone industry. Examples of appropriation of cell phones for social transformation in the health sector include the use of cell phones by hospitals and clinics, doctors and patients to make and follow up appointments. So to conclude, that there is more than inspiration and hope in the continent. The economy predicts that between 2011 and 2015, seven of the world's 10 fastest growing economies will be located in, Af in Africa. Additional figures from the IMF and the World Bank speak in the same direction. So I would, I would conclude that in, in, if in observing soup and a generation, there are signs suggesting more democratic and less top-down centralized ways of acquiring information and relating with parents, the state, and the rest of the world. The future of global, international, regional, and local, and interpersonal communication is not in thinking dominance. What is the point of independence that almost invariably results in dependence? We are part and parcel of an interconnected and entangled world of flexible mobility. Interests and destinies are so often entangled and mangled up that it is everyone's interest to seek conviviality and interdependence. Sue and her generation display an enviable ability to navigate and negotiate married identity. Their capacity to cultivate open-ended identities and relationships defy the bounded logic 
and zero-sum games of conventional indicators of nationality, citizenship, and belonging. Africa, just like Sugu and her generation, a well-placed, inspired world towards new geopolitical and communicative reality. As a continent that has demonstrated a formidable capacity to accommodate even when not being accommodated, Africa knows not the logic, but the logic of humility. Let's embrace, embody, and share Africa's logic of humility. Thank you very much. We thank you very, very much for joining us, but also introducing us to your daughter. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I believe we need to move along to the uh, next two speakers. But again, thank you very much for joining us. We're going to lose your image, I believe, now on the, on, on the screen. Yeah. Okay. It was a pleasure. Cheers. Thank you.